Hi everyone, welcome to the first laboratory of our neurobiology course at Providence College. I'm Joe DeGeorges. Today I would like to show you a prepared slide of the neuromuscular junction. We've talked about this connection a few times as it related to the acetylcholine receptor as well as vesicle fusion at the presynaptic terminal. But before I show you the slide, I want to talk a little bit about the compound light microscope. The microscope that we're using is a Zeiss Lab A1. And it's a very nice compound microscope. And we mentioned the objectives. The red is a 5X, yellow is 10, green is 20, blue is 40, and white is 100X. To turn the microscope on, that is the light bulb, which is in the base of the microscope, there's a button on the left-hand side of the microscope and you can see that there's light now emanating from this light bulb and it's going through this condenser lens which focuses the light onto the specimen. We have the stage which is going to hold the specimen when we get to that point. The microscope objective which of course magnifies and the light can travel either to the eyepiece so that we can see the sample with our eye or it can go to the camera so we can take a photograph. To get started, I'm going to put the slide on the stage. So I'm just going to push this lever back and the microscope slide slides in place and then I can release this and that arm holds the sample in place. And then I can move the sample around left and right with this knob or towards me or away from me with the upper knob. I'm going to turn the camera on. This is a Canon 5D Mark III and it's connected to an AC adapter so it doesn't need a battery. It gets the power from this cord and it's connected to the computer through this USB cable and we can find a software called the EOS Utility that allows us to interact with the camera through the keyboard, through the computer itself. There are a few versions of the EOS Utility, and the Canon 5D Mark III works with the EOS Utility version 2. And when the camera is connected and the power is on, this box comes up and you can select Camera Settings Remote Shooting. When you do that, this control panel comes up and we're going to go down to Live View Shoot. I'm going to click on that. And now this window shows what the camera sees in real time. You can see that there's a sample in there that's out of focus. So to focus the microscope, we have a coarse focus, which is this knob, and a fine focus, which is the outer knob, the smaller knob. And I'm going to focus the sample something like that and now if I want to move the sample over again I can move the slide left and right with this knob and towards me or away from me with this knob and we can zero in on our sample. Now we're only at 5x in this particular case, the 5x objective. And of course, if we look through the eyepiece, these are 10x. So the total magnification would be 50x if I'm looking through the eyepiece. The camera itself also has some optical elements in this barrel, and they are about a 10x objective. So it's 50x going to the camera. Now in order to set up this microscope correctly we have to align the condenser lens and focus the light onto the sample. Above the light source is the field diaphragm which is an aperture that can be closed down or opened up. It's an iris. And if I close this down, you can see that the light area gets smaller. And to focus the condenser lens, 
there's another knob down here and I'm going to raise the condenser lens towards the specimen until the edges of the condenser are perfectly sharp. Now there's too much light here so there's a knob on the right hand side that allows you to turn down the intensity of the light bulb. And when you do that, you notice the color of the light changes as well. And we'll talk about that in a moment. I'm going to go up to 10x. It'll be a little easier to adjust the microscope that way. And I'm going to refocus these, this, so that the edges of the field diaphragm are as sharp as I can get them. Something like that. Now this needs to be centered. We want the light to be in focus on the specimen and the light source centered relative to the microscope objective. And to do that, you need to move these two knobs, rotate them that is, and try to center the light source. in the sample. Now we can open up the field diaphragm a little bit to get a slightly better view. We can focus the edges of this. These are the edges of the diaphragm that we're seeing, that we're imaging here. Something like that and it's pretty well centered. Something like that. Once it's centered and it's sharp, the edges are as sharp as we can get them, we can now open up the field diaphragm and flood the sample with light. This area, as you can see, is very yellow and there's nothing here. There's not a sample in this part of the slide. I can move this over. This is just the piece of glass and the white balance is off in this particular case. I'm going to turn the light source up a little bit and once again you can see that it changes color and I'm going to do an auto white balance and to do that there's a little knob right here and if you click on that this window opens and we can go to this eyedropper which is the white balance tool and it says select personal white balance custom yes we want to do that so I'm going to select OK. And now with the eyedropper, I just go to a part of the slide that has no sample on it. And this should be white, or at least grayscale. It shouldn't have a tone to it, a color to it. And I'm just going to click it once with the mouse. And now you can see that there's no color any longer. It's grayscale. So now we have proper white balance. And I need to deselect this. Otherwise, the tool remains active. And anytime you click your mouse, the color will change. So I'm going to unclick this and I'm going to close that window. Now I can move the sample back underneath the microscope objective and I can focus the sample itself. If there's a particular part of the sample that I want to look at, I can either move this square like this, or I can leave it there and I can double click and it will move the square to my cursor and then blow that part of the scene up to what they call the zoom view. And now I can use this zoom view tool to really try to get this part of the sample as sharp as I can get it something like that. And now I can close this window. If I want to take a photograph, I can come up here to the shutter, which is right here, and press it. And that takes a photograph for me. And if I go down here, I can go to quick view, and I'll take another photograph. Whoops. Move this over a little bit. 
this is my final photograph. Okay, so the process of aligning the microscope and focusing the condenser so that the light is focused onto the sample is called curler illumination. And it's very important to understand what we did there. We focused the sample first, then we closed down the field diaphragm, which is an iris. We focused the edges of the field diaphragm with the focus knob for the condenser lens. This is the focus knob for condenser and this is focus knob for the sample. And then we centered this light source with these two adjustment knobs. And once everything was set, we reopened the field diaphragm so that the light would be even and would illuminate the entire view that we can see here. So it's curler illumination. The microscope objectives look a little bit like this. And this part is the glass. This is the lens of the objective. And a typical objective, a low power objective, would be something like 5x. And it turns out that there's a column of just air above the microscope objective. And if you wanted, you could put an eyepiece right here. And the eyepieces are typically 10x eyepieces, although they do vary. You could get a 12x eyepiece, for instance. And this part here is just a hollow tube. There's nothing in there. So you have a microscope objective and an eyepiece. And if you look through the eyepiece with one eye. I mean, I'm drawing a, a monocular microscope in this particular case. Um, you could see, um, you could see the specimen, which would be down here like this. So you have a microscope slide, and then you have your specimen. And in this case, with our neuromuscular junction, we have a microscope slide on top of it. in it's sealed by a resin, like this. And then we have a microscope stage. And it's possible, as we said, to slide the slide back and forth, either towards you or away from you, or left and right, so that you can look at different areas of the specimen. Then we have, at the base, just a typical light bulb. It's a tungsten light bulb in this case which exists in the base, and it gives off rays of light like this. And we said that we have a field diaphragm. So we have a variable adjustable aperture here, or an iris, so we can close this hole down or expand it a little bit. And then we have a condenser lens, which is here, and that acts to focus the light onto the specimen. So for curler illumination, we need to focus our sample first, so it's nice and sharp with the focus knob down here. And then we need to center the condenser lens so that the light is in line with the microscope objective. And to do that, we close down the aperture so that we can see the edges of this field diaphragm with our eye or camera in the case of um, the microscope that we're using today. And so we have to move this back and forth until everything's centered. And then we have to move this up and down, that is the condenser lens up and down until the edges of the aperture appear sharp to the eye. And so there's a second condenser um, focusing knob right here. But it's pretty simple. So at the bottom, all we have is a light source, a field diaphragm, which is an iris or an aperture. We have 
a condenser lens which focuses the light onto the specimen and then we focus the stage everything the condenser lens is attached to the stage and when we focus with this knob the focus knob for the specimen we are moving all of this either closer or further from the microscope objective until the part of the specimen that we want is in focus. So the compound microscope is pretty simple and if we have a 5x objective and a 10x eyepiece we said that the total magnification is 5x um, whoops, 5x times 10x, 5 times 10. So the total magnification is 50x. We could switch this to be a 10x objective. So 10x times a 10x objective would give us 100x. We have typically 20x objectives. 40x objectives, 100 x objectives. Now it turns out there are other objectives that you can buy. A typical one is a 63x objective for instance, but the highest magnification is about a 100x microscope objective. And the reason that is, is based on the physics or the wavelength of light and something known as the diffraction barrier. So it turns out that if you have two objects that are closer than 250 nanometers, okay, what's a nanometer? 1,000 millimeters equals 1 meter, 1,000 micrometers equals 1 millimeter, and 1,000 nanometers equals 1 micrometer. So we're talking about 250 nanometers, which is a quarter of a micrometer. Okay, but back to my point. If two objects are next to one another and they are closer than 250 nanometers, then they appear as a single object. So if there's one object, then it turns out that that peer is going to appear as one object. I mean, that's pretty obvious. But if you have two objects that are closer than 250 nanometers, then they still appear as a single object. And it doesn't matter how much you magnify this sample, you will never see the two objects. You will only see the one object. And that's the limit of resolution of the light microscope. Now it turns out it's worse in the z direction, meaning if you have two objects that are one on top of each other and you're trying to focus on this object or that object, if they are 750 nanometers or closer in the z direction, they will appear as a single object. So companies don't spend time and energy developing microscope objectives that are higher than 100x because you don't gain any more information. You can blow things up using Photoshop or a, or a Xerox machine or something like that. You don't need a high power microscope objective that would cost uh, $20,000, $10,000, depending on, on the company that makes it, when you can just use Photoshop to increase the size of the image. Okay, so let me take some of this away so we can keep part of our diagram here. What about our microscope? Our microscope doesn't look 
like the microscope that I've drawn here, um, we have our microscope objective like this. Whoops, 5x, let's say, again. And we have our cover slip, our sample, our slide, our, whoops, our microscope stage, our condenser lens, our field diaphragm, and our light bulb. So all that part is the same. And again, there's just a hollow tube that comes up like this. And they put in a mirror so that when the light comes through, it can bounce off the mirror and go through the eyepiece like this and the microscope splits the light information so that it goes instead of to just one eye, it goes to both eyes and to the camera up here. So the information is collected by this 5x objective and it's split and they use some optics to direct the light so that the light goes through both eyepieces and through what they call the Trinoc port, which is the eyepiece for the camera. Okay, now we want to take a look at the neuromuscular junction. And you can see here that this dark fiber here is a nerve cell, and these neurons are connecting to muscle. This pink material here are muscle fibers, and the neuron is right here synapsing with the neuron, with the muscle rather, at the neuromuscular junction. So we can go up to a higher magnification. This is the 20x objective. And here we can see a nice neuromuscular junction. So I'll expand that and focus on the sample there. And then I'll close this and take a photograph. Now it turns out that it's a very slow shutter speed in this case. It was 2.5 seconds which isn't a big deal in this particular scenario because our sample is fixed and it's motionless, it's still. But if we had critters running around like a, in a, from a plankton sample, then we would want a faster shutter speed. To do that, we would increase the light source so that we could have a faster shutter. So now if I mouse over the trigger. This is 1 40th of a second, which is much faster than 2.5 seconds, but we can increase that to something like 1 25th of a second. Whoops. Try to increase it a little bit here. 1 25th of a second. But you can see once again that the color changed as I adjusted the power on the light source. So I need to go back and redo my white balance by selecting the eyedropper and then going to a part of the sample that should be white. You can see this is kind of bluish in tint. It should be white or grayscale. That looks much better. And then I'm gonna turn off the eyedropper tool and close this window. So now we can see a neuron coming in and synapsing multiple times with different muscle fibers. Here's one here, here's one here, there's one here and here as well. And now we'll take another photograph of this. 
and that took the shot at 1 1 60th of a second, so much faster, and we get this nice image here. If we want the exposure to be a little bit less, maybe this looks a little bit bright, then we can play with exposure compensation, which is this bar here, and that's one third of a stop, and that's two thirds of a stop, and one full stop less would be half as much light. But I'm going to stop at two thirds of a stop. Take the photograph, and now we have a slightly darker image. So we know that when this axon, this neuron, fires an electrical action potential, the potential comes all the way down this nerve cell or multiple nerve cells and it causes calcium to rush in to the presynaptic terminal through voltage sensitive calcium channels. The synaptic vesicles fuse with the cell membrane, release neurotransmitter which diffuse across the synaptic cleft and bind to acetylcholine receptors in the muscle and then cause the muscle to contract. There we go. That's it for today. See you guys next time.